Clayton Ford is well known to some of you in this church, been a part of this church for some time now, he and his bride. He teaches one of our Sunday school classes, a very popular class. He's uh, been a pastor for four decades, as long as I have. Born in El Paso, Texas, but he tells me when he was two months old, he decided it was too hot there and moved to Virginia, Virginia, where he was raised. Ended up with his schooling undergraduate in North Carolina and then on to Berkeley for a master's. He survived that with his faith still intact and went on for a doctorate in Philadelphia. Pastored in Philadelphia and then most all the years in California. Two kids, both of them involved full-time in ministry. Author of a very, very exciting book I'll tell you about later. But we claim him and his wife as uh, one of our own. He's been a Baptist pastor and well-known across the state of California, but then well-known across America for his teaching and his renewal conferences on how to live life victoriously in the Holy Spirit. Would you join uh, back home uh, the celebration of having Clayton Ford speak for us today? Clayton, come on up here. Glad to have you. Honored to have you. Welcome, my brother. Thank Blessings you so on much. You, man. Thank you. you Thank brother. you. Thank you so much. Well, in the presence of a fellow Texan here, yeah, a couple of them, yeah. Praise the Lord. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, to preach the word today. Thank, so thankful for Pastor Jim Garlow. My wife and I can't think of a pastor we love better or respect more. And so we're so thankful to be here and uh, to be here with you all. Um, I'm going to read the scripture in just a moment, Ephesians 5, 15 to 20. But I wanted to tell you a little story. There's, there's a little man on a porch, a rocking chair, kind of creak, creak, creak. Someone was walking down the street, and he, and he said, stopped, and he looked at that little man, creak, creak, and he said, my goodness, how, how did you get to be your age? I mean, what's your secret? He said, well... <laughs> I, I smoke three packs of Marlboros a day. I, I drink two fifths of bourbon. I eat lard like it's ice cream. I eat, and uh, and he said, "My goodness, how old are you? Twenty <laughs> six. <laughs> We're talking about the Holy Spirit today, and it, it's going to be interactive. This, this is my first time preaching here. I need your support and kind of help me with something. When I say the words, we need the Holy Spirit, I want you to say with real passion, come Holy Spirit, fill me now. Can you practice that? Let's practice that. We need the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill me now. One more time. We need the Holy Spirit. All right, all right, that, I appreciate that. Now let's look at our uh, text for today, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Be c- very careful, Paul the Apostle writes to the Christians in Ephesus, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your goodness and your greatness. And we just want to tell you right now, we are nothing and can do nothing without you. We are so grateful for for your gift of Jesus Christ to us and the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit that makes life a high adventure. And we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to come now and to, to use this message to transform us, to fill us, to equip us and prepare us to change our world for Jesus Christ. It's in his, his name we pray. Amen. You know, Paul the Apostle, the conditions of his time, although there are a lot of things that are different, like technology and things like that, human nature is the same and the sin nature is the same. And, and so what he wrote to those early Christians in Ephesus 
are certainly applicable to us. Many things are surprisingly similar. There's confusion in our culture as to what is right and wrong. I, I pastored a church by Humboldt State University. Old hippies never died. They moved to Arcata, California, if you were wondering. You wonder where all those VW vans are. That's the, the graveyard of those right up there. But it is a place that's very hostile to Christian faith. As we know, many of the secular universities across our country, young people, they go into those, they get hammered, hammered intellectually, morally, spiritually, every kind of way. And Paul is looking to, to fortify and strengthen Christians in the Roman Empire, and here specifically in Ephesus. And he's saying, he's saying, Make the most of the time. He said, the days that you are living in are evil. Can we relate to that at all? As we see moral standards uh, decreasing, we see marriage redefined, we see uh, Christians being attacked and their churches burned in Egypt, we see all kinds of evidences that there's evil in the world. And, And Paul is saying, you live, you, you live in an evil time. There's trials, there's challenges, there's difficulties. And, and we get hammered by spiritual enemies. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. Have you seen evidence of that? We know that Jesus came though, didn't he? He came to give life and life abundantly. But he says, be careful how you live. Most Make the most of every opportunity. In other words, make your lives count. He says, don't get drunk with wine that leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. What he's saying is alcohol is a depressant. It brings out the lower nature, the, the, the uh, passions of the sinful nature. It dulls the mind and the senses. He says, don't go that route route that will dull your senses. Go this route. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be Godward in focus and praising Him and thankful hearts. See, that's how we make an impact. He says, don't get drunk with wine. Be alert. Be filled with the Spirit so that your life can count for Jesus Christ. Now, We're called to be world changers, to be dedicated to being alert, to do all we can in His power to make a difference for Him. And what He's saying here is clearly that we cannot make that impact in our community, in our own specific worlds of jobs and school, in our country, and in our world. We cannot make the impact that Paul the Apostle is, is uh, ad- 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 exhorting us to make unless what? Unless we are filled with the power and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit. A command, be filled. We need the Holy Spirit. Oh, a little anemic on that one. A little of got you sleeping, didn't I? Let's try it again. We need the Holy Spirit. Fill me now. Amen. Now, who is the Holy Spirit? I don't have time to cover all the bases, obviously, this morning. But the Holy Spirit is, there's one God who exists in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the, one helpful way to understand it for me, the Father willed the creation. He wills our salvation. He created all things through Christ, the Son, and Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. He makes possible what the Father wills, and the Holy Spirit activates what God the Father has willed, and and Jesus, the Son of God, has made possible so that God has sent Jesus, His Son. When we respond in faith to Christ and what He did for us on the cross, we receive the gift and the power of the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. Now, some of the basics, how important is the Holy Spirit in our personal lives and in our church lives and ministry? He's very important. 
He's very important. That's why Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, he said, wait for the promise of the Father. Now the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, came on the day of Pentecost. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, 3, that we have been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's a fact. But it's like receiving a gift at Christmas time and you open that gift box up and there the gift of the Holy Spirit right on top is regeneration, born again. But look, there's fruit of the Spirit in there. There's gifts of the Spirit. There's a fellowship of the Holy Spirit that makes us a family. There's a, queen, there's a worship. The Holy Spirit inspires worship. It causes us to be a symphony of worship. All these different things the Holy Spirit does. So we need Him for virtually every aspect of the Christian life. If you look at Christian life and ministry is as three-directional, upward, our relationship with God and worship and prayer, inward and fellowship and body life and building the church, outward and mission and evangelism and service, light and salt in the world. You look at the Bible and the New Testament throughout, the Holy Spirit's the one who brings us into a living relationship with God. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspires prayer and anoints us to pray. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspires worship, like we sang here with, with Josh Garlow leading. I, I, I love that song. I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. Wow. God is awesome. And the Holy Spirit inspires that direction. He inspires the inward, building the body. He gives spiritual gifts. He gives us love and uh, one heart and one mind. And then He inspires, uh, he inspires outreach and evangelism, Acts 1.8. You'll receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses throughout the world. The Holy Spirit, multidirectional. So you could say... We relate to the Father through the Son, Jesus, by the person of the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. But we need the Holy Spirit. Oh, I'll let you buy on that one. That was pretty weak, but I'll let you buy. You were thinking about what I was saying. That's what, what happened on that one. Well, our focus today, I want to share three compelling reasons why it's urgent that you and I be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now you jumped the gun, but that's all right. That shows a hunger for God, brother. That's good. Three compelling reasons. There are a lot more reasons, but that's what we have for focusing on today. Number one, the Holy Spirit lives inside of each of us and uh, if we've received Christ, and the Holy Spirit brings us into God's presence and anoints us. There's an outline if you, if you found it in your bulletin. And anoints us to worship and pray in ways that change people's lives and transform history. The Holy Spirit brings us into God's presence and anoints us to worship Him and pray in a way that transforms people's lives and changes history. Now I'm going to unpack that a little bit here. When we worship the Lord like arms high and heart abandoned, you know, the Bible says what? God inhabits what? The praises of His people. And as we worship the Lord, amazing things happen. The Holy Spirit's presence comes. And people can be actually born again or healed emotionally, uh, or many things of healing restoration right there as people are worshiping the Lord. In the church that I pastored up in Humboldt County was Arcata First Baptist Church. We had three services. We call them mild, medium, and hot. It's kind of like salsa, you know. It's like the young at heart class. Where's the camera for them? Love you guys. See, I teach that. That's the mild, you know? And the medium and the hot is, is you know, it's, it's a different style of worship and music. The mild, 
No drums are electric. The medium, drums are electric, but a little restrained. The hot one, well, you can guess, can't you? Just let her rip and all these college kids out and just, just uh, no time restraints at that third service either, like the early two. And one time I did a forum at the university and there were different religious leaders from religious traditions. I was the Christian on the panel and a, a Buddhist student a religious studies major who is Buddhist by profession, uh, said, could you share with us one experience in your tradition that's particularly meaningful to you? And so everyone went down, and I shared, I shared something that came to my mind. It was a particular Sunday, and as we worshiped the Lord, the Holy Spirit swept into that auditorium with such power that, that I just fell to my knees and wept and wept. And I I don't think that Sunday I ever got up to preach. It's like God just touched so many people without me saying a word. Uh, I got up and I said, I think God has spoken today. Um, And I shared that experience with that group of students. The very next Sunday, something like that happened. We were worshiping the Lord and the Holy Spirit's presence swept into such a degree that, that I just fell on my knees and was weeping. And I, I thought to myself, I just wish that Buddhist kid were here this morning to witness this. And I l- turned around and looked down the aisle. Three quarters of the way back was that Buddhist kid. And he was sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. God's presence melted his heart. You know, the Holy Spirit brings the presence of Christ, brings life into high adventure. Prayer is powerful. Uh, And when we worship and pray together, amazing things come out of that. Uh, Up up there in that same same time of ministry, we were at a Friday morning prayer meeting for revival. You know, we have prayer meetings for different needs of people. Uh, This one was particularly for come Lord shake the church in this county, do miracles. And the Holy Spirit, as, as we worshiped and prayed in that group, a vision came. Humboldt Evangelical Alliance, heal, heal. Second uh, Chronicles seven fourteen. It was almost like a computer download. And we, we took that and we shared the vision with some other pastors. Before it was over, There were 41 churches united across the county, evangelical churches. We brought in heaven's gates, hell's flames. 8,000 people attended uh, this this, uh, dramatic production and over 800 first-time decisions for Christ. See, God does amazing things when we honor Him and worship Him. It's like prayer takes wings. Uh, There's power. Uh, Acts 13, 1 and 2 tells us they were worshiping and fasting before the Lord. And the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Saul and Barnabas. And we know they turned the Roman Empire upside down. So we know praising and worshiping and praying community centered in Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit. We know it rocked the Roman Empire. And we need the Holy Spirit Next one, you you better be awake. Next one. The presence of the Holy Spirit not only enables us to believe doctrines, but to experience God's amazing presence and be transformed by it. The Holy Spirit gives us that power to pray. When we pray in one accord, miracles happen. The second reason that we need to be filled is the Holy Spirit empowers us to boldly and creatively witness for Christ to others and bring them to a saving faith. Acts 1.8, we've already said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, I call the Holy Spirit by some names. Uh, One name is the audacitator. Anybody know what audacity means? It means boldness. The Holy Spirit's the audacitator. He gives us boldness. I used to be a shy person. I was in a choir as a kid, and I was given a solo part, and my voice squeaked to a halt in the second line, and I cried to the end of the music. 
When I was in college, I read a speech. Seven, uh, 12 guys, Davidson College in North Carolina, just 12 guys in my class. I read the speech and my voice cracked. But so Holy Spirit gives us boldness. He gives us audacity. Um, I went in a doctor's office one time, and you know what you do in doctor's office? You pick up your magazine or whatever, and you're, everyone's quiet. And this man came in pulling an oxygen tank and the oxygen going in his nostrils. His wife was with him, and he looked pale as a sheet. I'm, I'm worried about this man. And uh, there were about eight or ten people sitting in there. I, Sir, are you okay? Um, someone had, he, he had been driving, and he drifted out in an intersection, almost hit a pedestrian. And the pedestrian picked up a big rock and smashed it on the hood of his car and cussed him out. And he was just shook up. And I, I said, sir, I, I said, I'm a Christian. Can I, can I uh, you know, pray for you? He said, no, I've tried all of that. Now, see, I might have been able to do that much in my own courage, courage level, but the Holy Spirit wasn't, wasn't finished. I, I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to come over, and I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> See, that part was Holy Spirit. Now, when you do that with a smile on your face, it's a lot better. <laughs> and I went over and I put my hand on him. And really, I forgot there were eight or ten other people in there. And I, I prayed for him. And he started convulsing like, like a deliverance of something bad. You know, I don't know. And I prayed for him. And I said, I'd like to lead you and your wife in a prayer to receive Christ. That did not come from me. I'm kind of timid sometimes. But I led them in a prayer, and they both prayed to receive Christ. And when I said amen, they said amen. And then they called his name, and he went in for his doctor's appointment, and his wife turned around and said, Thank you. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness if we're willing for him to use us. I preached a message one time. On, on being bold. And I, I don't know about you, Pastor Jim, if Carol was like this or not, but my wife likes to make sure the preacher is walking the walk, not just talking the talk. So I talked about these soldiers for Jesus guys who would do radical things. And, and so we went into a cafeteria for lunch that day, and a lot of people in there, and my wife steps out in the middle of the group. Now, she's pretty shy herself. But anyway, she goes up there and she says, Ladies and gentlemen, this is my husband, Clay, and he has something he wants to tell you. <laughs> oh, scared me to death. I turned red. I muttered something about Jesus loves you. But after that... <clears throat> I got her back. I mean, after that, <laughs> we have a lifetime commitment. Anywhere, anytime, we can do that. And it is absolutely astounding how many opportunities that opens up. We were in Elko, Nevada, uh, driving through at a McDonald's. And a man comes and sits beside our table. And I said, sir, this is my wife, Sherry. She has something she wants to tell you. You know, when you do that, you have a captive audience. It's like, <laughs> so you better have something to say. She said, well, Jesus loves you. He said, why did you say that? Because he really does. It turned out this man was a Native American. He had been brought up in Native religion and had been exposed to Mormonism. His niece was a Baptist. And he said, I am so confused. We talked to him for an hour and a half, and he poured out his life and we ended up laying hands on him right there in McDonald's and praying, tears coming down his cheeks. And he said to us, how did you know what we needed to hear, what I needed to hear? And, and I said, we didn't, but he did. Now, see, just a simple way of getting past the timidity zone. Most of us are like the Arctic River, frozen over at the mouth. Just to open it up, you know. 
give the Holy Spirit a chance to get out of the box. We need the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've done that all over the country in every setting you can imagine. One time we were in a, in a, in a Wendy's in, in a Dayton, Ohio, and six people came in, sat right beside our table. It was in the evening. I said, ladies and gentlemen, this is my wife, Sherry. She has something she wants to tell you. Now, instantaneously when you do that, it's like that, all six. And at that very second, all the lights went out in six city blocks. You could not see your hand in front of your face in that Wendy's. And a little boy said, we're listening. (laughs) You got our attention. (laughs) And she said, the world is coming to an end. No, she didn't. (laughs) The Holy Spirit, he's creative. I have a grandson named Jonathan. He's 16. Now I know know you're thinking, how could he have a grandson that old? Well, you know, it was an arranged marriage. I was 10 and she was... Okay, never mind. Can't lie about it, I guess. But our, our grandson has grown in boldness. You know, my son's a pastor up in Santa Clarita and... And uh, we have five grandkids up there, and they're all awesome kids. But my grandson went up to my son, Billy, just last week or week before last. They were in an outreach. Thirty from their church went to a church 40 miles away and did a VBS and reached out to their community and helped bring life to that church. But they won over a 100 and some people to Christ in street evangelism that week. And my grandson, Jonathan, he told my son, uh, he said, Dad, I, I don't think I'm afraid to share Christ with anybody. And Billy said, oh, yes, you are. He said, who? Pretty girls. <laughs> and he blushed. He's very shy. Well, over a little ways, there were a, a basketball girls team with a coach practicing just a couple of weeks ago at a park in uh, Santa Paula, I think it is where they went. And, and uh, my, my grandson goes, Well, I'm going to go witness to them. Well, now you need Holy Spirit boldness to do that, don't you? So one of the women leaders said, well, you know, the coach there, they may not like that, but I don't want to hold you back if God's telling you to do it. So, So he gets and he walks over there and then practices over just as he arrives. And he started talking to them and the coach resisted for a while and people The other team members looking across the park. Oh, boy, what are they going to do to you? Anyway, by the time it was over, all 11 girls and the coach prayed to receive Jesus Christ. That was a week and a half ago. Unbelievable. The Holy Spirit gives us boldness. You know, there are millions, billions of wandering souls who are lost without Jesus. Sometimes it's teamwork. The Holy Spirit's creative. It's teamwork. When I was uh, preaching a sermon, I veered off my notes, uh, and I told a story for some reason I didn't know about that man in Elko, Nevada, the Native American, and how I had learned to be sensitive to Native American people and all they've been through and, and uh, much of their culture robbed from them and so many things, the pain that they have and the need for restoration. And uh, so I told that story in that service and, and said something of an apology for, for the church and how in times past particularly uh, there's not been that awareness and sensitivity. I don't know, I didn't know why I told that story. But after the service, this man that lived in the redwood trees with straggly hair comes up in an a old, used army fatigue jacket. And he's got this bundle in his arms of a blanket. And he's shaking like this. And 
he said, I want you to have this. And I didn't know what it was. I had never seen him in my life. Uh, I said, well, well, tell me about it. He said, <clears throat> he said, I was on my way to kill two people who had been mocking me. He said, in here is my prized possession. In here, in that blanket, was a 1944 Marine Corps machete. It was his prized possession. Now it's one of mine. He said, you have to have this. I said, why do you want to give this to me? I was on my way to kill two people with it, and somebody from your church saw me walking and said, come to church with us. Come to church with us. See how that's teamwork? How the Holy Spirit gave the boldness for those people in my church to invite him to come to church, even though he looked wild and crazy? He came. And although I had my sermon prepared, and I didn't have anything about El Col Nevada Native American in my sermon notes, I told that story. And that man comes up to me and he says, I want you to have this. My mother's a Native American, and I've never heard a white man say I'm sorry before in my life. And he wept and he accepted the Lord. And that is one of my prized possessions. I thought about bringing it today, but thought better of it. Thought better of it. <laughs> Number three, the Holy Spirit anoints us to minister in a naturally supernatural way. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He, he sent me to preach good news to the poor. To bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The Holy Spirit anoints us to touch people's lives with the love and supernatural power of God. You know, if you are open for God to use you, He can use you to do whatever He wants to do. Sometimes we have a mindset that's for other people. But are you a child of God? Do you love Jesus? Do you have the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life? You've been born again? God can use you to do anything. A lot of people don't know that, so they don't step out. But I'll tell you, Jesus loves people. The Holy Spirit loves people. He wants out of the box, the four walls of our churches and out of the creeds. And He wants to use you and me to touch people's lives. We need the Holy Spirit. Feel me now. I had a golfing buddy I uh, would play golf with sometimes. And he called me one morning. He said, my son has a 48-year-old friend that's dying in the hospital. His organs are shutting down. He's not a Christian. He may not let us pray for him, but they've called in the relatives. He may not last the day. Can we try to pray for him? I said, sure. On my way into the ICU in that hospital, I sensed the Holy Spirit say these words, he's too young to die. I walked in there. I said, sir, you're too young to die. I said, may we pray for your healing. He said, um, yes. I said, you know, if Jesus heals you, you're going to serve him, right? He said, yeah. Now, you know, when someone's dying, that's, they're open, if they're ever going to be open. So put our hands on his chest, and I just said, Father, in the name of Jesus, activate these organs. And then I said, can I lead you in a prayer to put your trust in Christ? And he prayed out loud, and he received Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And we went out to the golf course. I hit a few redwood trees, lost a few balls. Typical great day for me on the golf course. Got home, and I got a call from my friend. He said, Clay, the, uh, he said, the doctors think they misdiagnosed because all the organs are activated. And that man went home well two days from then. Amen. 
Now, that's not a story about me. That's a story about Jesus and how he wants to use any of us. Let him use you. Be winsomely bold. So many stories I could tell. I'm running out of time here. But uh, just one more story. My daughter, Hannah, she's a worship leader, a singer, working on her fourth CD. But so, uh, f- a couple, few years back, she went to Disneyland and invited two friends to go. She said, the Lord really st- pulling on my heart to go to Disneyland on this particular day and that he's going to use, God's going to use me at Disneyland. And so she found two friends to go, and they were standing in a line for a ride, and, and there was this eighth-grade boy with his arm in a sling. And they said, can we pray for your arm? And he said, well, I guess. So they prayed for him. His arm had been crushed. His shoulder had been crushed by an accident, and he was a football player, and he was out for a year. Anyway, they prayed for him, and God immediately healed that arm. And he took it out of the sling, and he was going like that. He called his dad on the cell phone. Dad, dad. His dad was a medical doctor. Dad, I'm here at Disneyland, and some crazy people, I mean, some people, they prayed for my arm, and it's well. He said, no, son, just relax. Put it back in the sling. Be careful. Be careful. That kid texted all his friends. It was an eighth grade charter school graduation celebration at Disneyland. And they had people coming from all over. You can look on YouTube at this, hannaford.com. It's on YouTube, Disneyland Revival or something. But but, uh, anyway, there were a hundred kids that came streaming over there. Not for Pirates of the Caribbean. They came over to see what God was doing. Because there were some young people on fire for God. Before they were done, there were many kids healed of different things. There was one girl had her hand broken in a kind of a splint and stuff. And they said, can we pray for that? And she said, yes. Now, the website's uncensored, which I will be. I mean, it is censored, which I will be also. But they prayed for her hand. And she said, could you take that off and see if it's better? Oh, bleep. <laughs> She was completely healed. Before it was over, there's a picture in there of 30 kids in a circle all praying to receive Jesus Christ. This young teenage boy, uh, he said, boy, I can't wait to serve Jesus and turn the world upside down. And my daughter says, uh, well, how long have you been a Christian? Oh, five minutes. <laughs> when I saw what you, God did, five minutes. You know, our church is... Our churches need to realize Christianity is not just intellectual doctrines. It's the life and the power of God. Why do you think so many people go to astrologists and and, uh, mediums and all this kind of stuff? Why do you suppose? One of the reasons is there's a lot of spiritual need out there. And another reason is a lot of the church has abdicated the realm of the supernatural And let that be taken over by the occultists, cults. That's kind of strange, isn't it? Since we have the God that spoke and created the world, the universe. We have a Savior who did miracles of every kind. We have the Holy Spirit who did miracles all over the place. Where did so much of the church become satisfied with a powerless Christianity? See, our our country is hungry spiritually. They need to know that Jesus Christ is alive, that he has power. We need to be, I'm going to say it real soft, see what you do. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. We need the Holy Spirit. You know, I want to just bow our heads here as I close. Heavenly Father, this is it's one of the best churches in the country, I believe. It stands for your righteousness and truth, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know there's a, an enormous measure of your Holy Spirit in this place. But Lord, all of us, we know we need more. 
We need more. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. And if, if you just want to pray a prayer of surrender with me and to ask Jesus to fill you with his Holy Spirit, to use your life to make a difference, you just pray this prayer sincerely from your heart right now. Pray it out loud with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. All that I am and have and can do, I give to you. And I ask you now, Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want more so I can make a difference in our world for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.